This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 1. Coming up on Space Time. The most distant world ever visited. A supernova could have wiped out marine megafauna. And how the Martian moon Phobos got its groove on. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's New Horizons spacecraft has just completed the most distant flyby ever undertaken, swooping down to just 3,540 kilometres above the desolate, frozen surface of the dark Kuiper Belt object Ultima Thurley. Officially catalogued as 2014 MU69, Ultima Thurley is a mysterious 30-kilometre-wide mountain in space. One of tens of thousands of frozen worlds, comets and RC debris which circle the Sun out beyond the orbit of Neptune in a little understood region of the solar system called the Kuiper Belt. Ultima Thule is an ancient traditional name used to describe the most distant place known, a land well beyond the borders of the known world. In ancient Greek and Roman times, Ultima Thule was the place most farthest north, now thought to refer to either Iceland or Greenland although both the Orkney and Shetland Islands were also referred to as Ultima Thule in medieval times. During its close approach flyby, New Horizons is imaging and mapping Ultima Thule with its array of scientific instrument packages. Seven scientific experiments are recording images, spectra and physical measurement values. These include two plasma instruments known as Pepsi and SWAP, a dust detector called Valencia, a radio experiment known as Rex, and three optical devices, the UV spectrometer ALICE and the Laurie and Ralph high-resolution camera systems. Located more than 6.6 billion kilometres away, signals from New Horizons travelling at the speed of light will still take over six hours to reach NASA mission control back on Earth. This extreme distance means it will take almost two years for all the data being gathered during this flyby to be beamed back to Earth. The last few months have seen mission managers searching the skies along New Horizons' flight path just to make sure there aren't any unexpected surprises along the way. You see, speeding along at over 62,764 kilometres per hour means even a particle as small as a grain of rice could be lethal to the baby grand piano-sized probe. New Horizons lead scientist Alan Stern from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, says this flyby is both riskier and more difficult than the rendezvous with Pluto back in 2015. See, that's because the spacecraft's older, the target's a lot smaller, the flyby's closer, and it's taking place over 1.6 billion kilometres further away. And one of the problems is, scientists still don't fully understand Ultimate Thule or its environment. They know Ultima Thule takes around 300 Earth years to complete an orbit around the Sun, but that's about it until the first images come through in a few days' time. Ultima Thule could be a long, elongated body. Possibly it's a binary asteroid system made up of two separate bodies gravitationally bound together. Or it could simply be a loose clump of icy rubble. The thing is, it's not reflecting much light, so getting any details on it at all, pretty limited. The early observations we do have show the surface to have a generally pinkish-reddish hue to it. The pink indicates the presence of ices. But as for the red, well, that seems to be a common colour among Kuiper Belt objects, including both Pluto and its binary partner Sharon. As we get more detailed images, they should reveal other features such as impact craters, pits and sinkholes. Whatever Ultima Thule's ultimate configuration, the simple fact is, no spacecraft has ever visited anything so distant or primitive before. But then Ultima Thule has been an enticing target, a distant, deep-frozen, preserved relic dating back to the creation of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. New Horizons was launched on January the 19th, 2006, from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida aboard an Atlas V rocket. The probe made history on July the 14th, 2015, when it became the first ever spacecraft to visit Pluto, flying just 12,500 kilometres above the 2,377 kilometre wide dwarf planet's surface. The spacecraft also studied Pluto's binary partner Sharon and their four moons, Styx, Nix, Kerberos and Hydra. It provided science with a new understanding of the Pluto system, and scientists are expecting just as many new revelations from the close flyby of Ultima Thurley. 
I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. A new study suggests large marine species were wiped out in a supernova-triggered mass extinction event some 2.6 million years ago at the dawn of the Pleistocene. The supernova, located just 150 million light years away, would have appeared as an oddly bright light in the prehistoric sky, lingering for many weeks, maybe even a few months. But within a few hundred years, long after the strange light in the sky had dwindled, a tsunami of cosmic energy from that same shattering stellar explosion could have reached our planet and pummeled the atmosphere, triggering mass extinctions of large ocean animals, including shark species the size of a school bus. A new study reported in the journal Astrobiology examines the effects of such a supernova and possibly more than one on large ocean species. The study's lead author, Professor Adrian Mallott from the University of Kansas, says the supernovae could have affected the Earth at some time or another. What makes this event special is that this time Mallott and colleagues have found evidence of nearby events at a specific time, and they were able to determine just how far away they were. And so they could actually compute how that would have affected the Earth and then compare it to what they know about what happened at that time. Malat says recent papers revealing ancient seabed deposits of iron-60 isotopes provided the slam-dunk evidence for the timing and distance of the supernovae. As far back as the mid-1990s, scientists knew that iron-60 was a telltale sign for supernovae. That's because there's no other way for it to get to Earth other than from supernovae. You see, iron-60 is radioactive, and so were it formed with the Earth, it would be long gone by now. Therefore, any deposits found today must have rained down on the Earth later, and the most likely source would have been nearby supernova events. The authors say there's still some debate about whether there was only one single nearby supernova or a whole chain of them. Malat favours a combination of the two, a big chain of supernovae with one that was unusually powerful and close. See, if you look at the iron-60 residue, there's a huge spike 2.6 million years ago, but there's also an excess scattered back nearly 10 million years. Other evidence for a whole series of supernovae events is found in the very architecture of the local universe, especially a structure in the interstellar medium known as the local bubble. It's a 300 light-year wide region of very hot, very low density gas. Nearly all the gas clouds have been swept out of this area, and our solar system is right on its edge. The best way to manufacture a bubble like this in interstellar space is by having a whole bunch of supernovae blowing it bigger and bigger. And this seems to fit well with the idea of a whole chain of supernovae going off one after the other. Previous calculations were based on the idea of a single supernova going off, and the energy from that single event then sweeping over the Earth. At the local bubble, and the cosmic rays kind of bounce off the sides of the bubble, resulting in a cosmic ray bath lasting maybe 10,000 to 100,000 years. But by using a series of supernovae going off one after the other, then these things would feed more and more cosmic rays into the local bubble for literally millions of years. Now, whether or not there was just one supernova or a whole series of them, the supernova energy that spread layers of iron-60 all over the Earth would have caused penetrating particles known as muons, heavy versions of electrons, to literally shower the planet, resulting in increased rates of cancer and mutations, especially for larger animals. That's because muons are several hundred times more massive than electrons and therefore very penetrating. Even normally, there's lots of them passing through you right now. Nearly all of them pass through harmlessly. About one-fifth of your radiation dose comes from muons. But when this wave of cosmic rays hit, you could multiply those muons by several hundred. Still, only a small fraction of them would interact in any way, but when that number is so large and their energy so high, you'll still get increased mutations and cancer and that would have had serious biological consequences. The authors estimate cancer rates would have gone up by about 50% for something the size of a human. And the thing is, the bigger you are, the worse it gets. So for something as big as an elephant or even bigger, say a whale, that dose would go way up. So a supernova 2.6 million years ago may well have been the cause for a marine megafaunal extinction thought to have happened during the Phylocene-Pleistocene boundary, where some 36% of the genera were estimated to have become extinct. According to the authors, the damage from the muons would have extended down several hundred metres into ocean waters, but of course, the greater the depth, the less severe. So, high mass and consequently high energy muons which can reach deeper into the oceans would have been the more relevant agent for biological damage as depth increases. 
Malot says one of those extinctions 2.6 million years ago would have involved a shark known as Megalodon, a close relative of today's Cacarodon cacarius, the Great White, also known as the White Pointer or simply White Death. Great Whites are known to grow to well over 7 metres in length. That's the size of Bruce, the mechanical special effects shark used in the movie Jaws. But textbooks show White Point is getting much bigger than that, with the record being a colossal 12 metres or 36 feet. But Cacaridon Cacarius's ancient cousin, Cacaridon Megalodon, grew much bigger than that, to around 18 metres or 60 feet. You're going to need a bigger boat. So, Malat says imagine the great white shark in Jaws, which was enormous, but make it three times bigger to the size of Megalodon. And although the largest predator of its day, Megalodon suddenly disappeared about 2.6 million years ago, the time of the supernova event. Malat speculates this may have had something to do with these muons from exploding stars. He says basically the bigger the creature is, the bigger the increase in radiation would have been. And evidence of a supernova or series of them is another puzzle piece to help clarify the possible reasons for the phylocene pleistocene boundary extinction. Malat says there really hasn't been a good explanation for the marine megafaunal extinction until now. And so this could be it. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study suggests that strange grooves crisscrossing the surface of the Martian moon Phobos could have been made by rolling boulders blasted free during an ancient asteroid impact. The findings, reported in the journal Planetary and Space Science, are based on new computer models designed to simulate the movement of debris from the Stickney Impact Crater, a huge gash at one end of Phobos's potato-shaped body. These models show that boulders rolling across the surface in the aftermath of the Stickney impact could have created the puzzling patterns of grooves seen on Phobos today. The study's lead author Ken Ramsley from Brown University says these grooves are a distinctive feature of Phobos and just how they formed has been an issue of debate for planetary scientists for well over 40 years. Phobos's grooves, which are visible across most of the Moon's surface, were first glimpsed back in the 1970s by NASA's Mariner and Viking missions. Over the years, there's been no shortage of explanations put forward as to how they formed. Some scientists have postulated that large impacts on Mars could have showered the nearby Moon with groove-carving debris. The most popular theory now is that Mars's gravity is slowly pulling Phobos apart, and these grooves are signs of what will eventually be a structural failure of the Moon, turning it in a few million years from now into nothing more than a ring of debris surrounding the red planet. Ramsley is part of another group of scientists who hypothesised that there could be a connection between the grooves and the Stickney impact crater. Back in the late 1970s, planetary scientists Lionel Wilson and Jim Head, two of the co-authors on this paper, proposed the idea that ejecta, bouncing, sliding and rolling boulders from Stickney may well have carved the grooves. For a moon the size of the diminutive Phobos, which is just 27 kilometres across, Stickney is a huge impact crater at some 9 kilometres wide. That would have had a massive effect on this tiny body. Ramsley says the impact that formed the crater could have blown free tons of rocks, making the giant boulder rolling idea entirely plausible. But there are also some problems with this idea. For example, not all the grooves are aligned radially with Stickney, as one might intuitively expect if Stickney ejector really did do the carving. Another problem is that some of the grooves are superimposed over the top of others, and that suggests that at least those grooves would have already been there when the superimposed ones were created. And that raises the question, how could there be grooves created at two different times from a single event? What's more, a few of the grooves run through Stickney itself. That suggests the crater must have already been there when the grooves were formed. Then there's this conspicuous dead spot on Phobos where there are no grooves at all. So, why would all those rolling boulders just skip this one particular area? It's all a bit of a puzzle. To explore these questions, Ramsley and colleagues designed computer models to see if there really was any chance that the rolling boulder model could recreate the confounding patterns seen on Phobos. The models simulated the paths of the boulders ejected from Stickney, taking into account Phobos's shape and topography, as well as its gravitational environment, its rotation, and even its orbit around Mars. Once the computer had done its thing, Ramsley says he was surprised at how well the model recreated the groove pattern seen on Phobos. 
The model showed that the boulders tended to align themselves in sets of parallel pads, and that aligned well with the parallel grooves seen on Phobos. And amazingly, the models have also provided a potential explanation for some of the other more puzzling groove patterns. See, the simulations show that because Phobos is so small and therefore gravitationally weak, ejecta from the Stickney impact would just, well, keep rolling, rather than stopping after a kilometre or so as they would on a larger body. In fact, it's possible that some of these ejecta boulders could well have rolled and bounded their way all the way around the tiny moon, literally circumnavigating it. And that could explain why some of the grooves aren't radially aligned with the crater. So boulders which started out rolling across the eastern hemisphere of Phobos could well produce grooves that appear to be misaligned with the crater when they reach the western hemisphere. And if true, that round-the-globe rolling would also explain how some of the grooves are superimposed on top of others. The model also shows that grooves laid down right after the impact could have been crisscrossed minutes to hours later by other boulders completing their global journeys. And in some cases, those globe-trotting boulders could well have rolled all the way back to where they started, in Stickney Crater. And that would explain why Stickney itself has grooves. But then there's the dead spot. Ramsley says that area turns out to be a fairly low elevation area on Phobos, surrounded by a higher elevation lip. And he says the simulation showed that boulders would hit that lip, take a flying leap over the dead spot, before coming down again on the other side. Think of it like a ski jump. The boulders keep on rolling, but suddenly there's no ground under them. They end up flying across the gap, then landing on the surface and rolling again. All told, Ramsley says these models answer some key questions about how ejecta from Stickney could have been responsible for Phobos' complicated groove patterns. As for me... I'm sticking with the idea that Phobos is being slowly torn apart by the red planet's gravitational tidal forces. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The European Space Agency has selected Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO, to take over operational support and maintenance for its new Norcia Deep Space Tracking Station. The facility, located 130 kilometres northeast of Perth, includes a 35-metre parabolic dish antenna, DSA-1, which provides telemetry and communication support for the agency's launch operations and deep space missions exploring the solar system. The new Norcia facility is one of three European Space Agency deep space tracking stations linking the agency's mission control centre in Darmstadt, Germany, with ESA spacecraft. The others are located in Cerberos, Spain, and Malaga in Argentina. The new Norcia facility opened in 2003. It's currently tracking the locations and sending commands to control spacecraft hundreds of millions of kilometres from Earth, including Pepe Colombo, launched last October to explore Mercury, and Mars Express, which is orbiting the red planet, collecting information about its geology, atmosphere, surface environment, history of water, and potential for life. ESA's ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter and Gaia missions are also being supported through new Norcia. New Norcia also provides tracking support to scientific and interplanetary missions operated by other space agencies, including NASA and Japan's JAXA, under resource sharing agreements. As well as deep space mission support, New Norcia also provides crucial tracking services for Ariane, Soyuz, and Vega launches, lifting off from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana. The CSIRO already manages NASA's Canberra Deep Space Communications Complex at Tidbin Billa, as well as some of Australia's leading radio astronomy telescope facilities, including the Parkes Radio Telescope, the Australia Telescope Compact Array at Narrabri, and the Australian components of the Square Kilometre Array project. The head of the CSIRO's Western Australian Observatory Operations, Kevin Ferguson, says the CSIRO has been a key player in the Australian and international space industry for more than 75 years. Ferguson says the CSIRO's operational support of ESA's new Norcia facility will complement the organisation's existing role with NASA and builds on decades' worth of experience operating large, complex spacecraft tracking stations and radio astronomy infrastructure. This is going to be uh, another uh, opportunity for Australia and the space industry to continue to grow. The CSIRO is already operating the Tidbin Billa complex for NASA at Canberra, part of their deep space network. Will it be the same sort of arrangement? It's similar. 
are. It's not exactly the same. The difference between the two facilities is ESA will still be operating it remotely from Darmstadt in Germany, whereas the Tidbin Billa model is that the staff there operate it from the facility itself. But with that said, the capability to operate it from Nunorsha, should there be communication problems between us and Europe, that's still in place. That still needs to be implemented if necessary. Exactly what does the Nunorsha facility do? It has a dual purpose, Stuart. It basically, it has its deep space tracking purpose. That's its fundamental role. So any vehicle transiting through the solar system, whether it's just a space mission or an interplanetary mission, its primary purpose is to track those vehicles, relay communications, collect data, and effectively just understand where it's at at any given time. That's its primary role. So that's things like Bepi Colombo and uh, Mars Express. That's exactly correct, Stuart. Yes, yeah. With uh, Bepi Colombo just being launched in October, that's one of its critical mission requirements of current time. The secondary role of Nunarsha is to conduct launcher tracking activities. What that means is that, that when rockets are launched from Earth, Nunarsha has a responsibility to track the uh, the trajectory until it gets into space. That's ground tracking station work when something lifts off from Kourou. Yes, that is correct. Tell me a little bit about the facility. Uh, uh, what does it consist of? Uh, it, it's not a large facility. It is, however, holding uh, one of the, the largest dishes in Australia, which is a 35-metre parabolic and antenna, that's its main asset for the deep space tracking. You do need large apertures like, like 35 metres and above to give you a good a good signal uh, collection on that. It also contains a four and a half metre smaller antenna and that one is a faster moving one and that's the one that's used for the actual launcher tracking. It's not the only tracking station that ESA operates, like with NASA's Deep Space Network, which also has dishes in Madrid and in Goldstone. ESA does the same sort of thing, doesn't it? it that's exactly right. It's, a, it's all almost a very similar model uh, on a longitudinal aspect on Earth. With ESA, they have the Nunorsha here in Australia. They also have a facility in Madrid, just north of Madrid at Cebreros. And their third facility is out in Argentina at Malargue. So effectively, NASA and ESA have a similar model in that they cover the Americas, they cover Europe, and they also cover um, the Australasian aspect. As well as that, you guys have a, a rather large solar farm as well. Yes, it's not a, at New Norsh, it's not a bad size solar farm. It's quite a recent addition, actually. Just something that we're learning about, having only just uh, entered into discussions with them a year ago with ESA. So we've been doing this ongoing process for almost a year now to get into contract with them. So, so Cyrus is quite excited about the fact that we can take on this responsibility in New Norsh. It's not a big facility. It's got two, two antenna and a power plant with a solar farm and the fact that it's 130 kilometres northeast of Perth uh, introduces a bit of travel as well. It used to be an old monastery, didn't it? Uh, just outside of there, sure. It's basically, um, it's about 10 minutes south of the monastic town of Nunorsha. So it, it, basically the facility resides up a, a, a hillside and uh, if you travel north 10 minutes, you'll get to Nunorsha, which is the, the monastic town, which currently has the monks practicing their religion there. And it's, it's, it's really quite it's quite a special place, actually, when you visit it. It's really, it's surreal, I think is the best term. It's uh, in the middle of a farming community. You've got these large pinkish buildings. It's very Spanish-esque. It's very lovely. With the advent of Australia's new space agency, how, how does the CSIRO see this in terms of working for Australia? Working um, with, with ESA and also having a, a long-term relationship with NASA and with the creation of the Australian Space Agency, I think having those three working collaboratively and with CSIRO working across the three of them, I think that's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for Australia to further develop and further grow the Australian global space market. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Is there a lot of technology with the new Norcia facility which is different from what NASA were using at Tidbin Villa? No, they're very similar. I mean, there's, there'll be slight differences between front ends and so on, but they're very similar in concept. Just, I think the size of the facility is the only difference between the two, just scale factor. I mean, it's the Tidman Billa one. They, they operate, run, maintain all from that facility and they have a number of uh, large antenna to do so. And the New Norcia one is a, is a smaller model, but it is still quite technical in the way of what equipment it does have, yes. Is there a lot of cooperation between the two, NASA and ESA, when it comes to using dishes from both facilities for tracking purposes? I know that's happened in the past. It has happened in the past and it will continue to happen in the way forward. The idea of backing each other up 
it's something that's been well experienced and it's certainly the right thing to do. We, you spend a lot of time, effort and money launching these rockets with their very expensive payloads. The last thing you want to do is see failings happen just through bad collaboration or lack of collaboration. So with ESA and NASA working closely, that's an excellent model. Yeah, I know that uh, you know she provided backup when the Mars InSight mission landed on the red planet. Yeah, and I think that's the that's the correct way forward as well. I think working together, ensuring that each are um, covering each other's uh, back is a good way forward. I think there'll be many more opportunities like that in the way forward. That's the head of the CSIRO's Western Australian Observatory Operations, Kevin Ferguson. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Russia has carried out a successful test flight of its Soyuz 2 rocket from its new Vostochny Cosmodrome in Russia's Far East Amur region. The launch was only the fourth for the new facility, which will eventually replace the famous Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. Aboard the rocket for the flight were the Canopus V5 and V6 Earth observation satellites, together with 26 small micro, nano and CubeSats. The 473-kilogram Canopus satellites, a small remote-sensing spacecraft using panchromatic and multispectral imaging systems to monitor natural disasters, forest fires, the release of pollutants, water and coastal resources, and agriculture and land use. A Chinese Long March 3 rocket has blasted into orbit carrying a new prototype telecommunications satellite. The TJS-3 satellite was flown from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Centre in southwestern China's Sichuan province. The satellite was developed by high school engineering students as part of a three-year endeavour. It'll beam back basic telemetry, such as subsystem voltages, temperatures and CPU status, as it orbits the planet. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. The Kremlin says its new hypersonic avant-garde missiles can reach speeds of over 30,000 kilometres an hour. That's more than 2,000 kilometres an hour faster than orbital speeds. Russian President Vladimir Putin has just watched the final test flight for the new missile, claiming it's capable of defeating any and all existing missile defence systems. The test involved an avant-garde missile launched from Domborovsky in southwestern Russia, which then flew east across the Eurasian continent, travelling more than 6,116 kilometres to successfully hit a target at the Kura test range on the Kamchatka Peninsula. The test flight showed the new missile to be capable of Mach 27. That's some 33,000 kilometres an hour. The missile, which has also been known by various code names such as Object 4202, YU-71 and YU-74, is a hypersonic wing glide vehicle, carried as a MIRV or Modable Independently Targetable Reentry Vehicle Payload, delivered by either the older SS-19 Stiletto or newer RS-28 Zarmat intercontinental ballistic missile. However, unlike conventional ICBMs, the Avangard is released by the launch vehicle's second stage before reaching space. It then powers up its own onboard scramjet engine to further accelerate to even higher top speed. Russian officials say that as well as withstanding the incredible heat generated by atmospheric friction, it's also capable of undertaking sharp high-speed in-flight manoeuvres, allowing it to avoid any anti-missile defence system. And as for the icing on the cake, well, the missile carries a thermonuclear warhead with a blast yield equivalent to more than 2 megatons of TNT. Putin says his new toy will begin deployment through the Russian military later this year. A new study has shown that exposure to violence early in life, such as physical, emotional or sexual abuse, is associated with faster biological ageing, including pubescent development and a cellular metric of biological ageing called epigenetic age. By contrast, children exposed to early life adversity involving deprivation, such as neglect and food insecurity, showed signs of delayed pubescent development compared with their peers. The study involved some 247 children and adolescents aged 8 to 16. The findings, reported in the journal Biological Psychiatry, demonstrate how different types of early life adversity can have different lifelong consequences for a child's development. Paleontologists have discovered that flying reptiles known as pterosaurs actually had primitive feathers just like dinosaurs and ancient birds. 
A report in the journal Nature claims a pair of Anorong Nathed pterosaurs, already found to have little bits of fur covering their bodies, also had some of that hair branched into primitive feather-like structures. The two specimens, which date back to around 160 to 165 million years ago, were discovered in the Dauhugal Formation in what is now in Mongolia. The findings mean that either feathers or feather-like structures developed independently in both pterosaurs and dinosaurs during the Jurassic period, or that the emergence of feathers goes back much earlier, more than 250 million years to a time before dinosaurs evolved away from reptiles. Further studies showed no anatomical differences between these pterosaur feathers and those of dinosaurs or early birds. And in case you were wondering, a chemical analysis shows the plumage was red in colour. And finally for now, if you're taking your time when feeding your pet, well, it looks like Fluffy and Fido are probably onto you, because it turns out they can tell when you're dawdling. A new study reported in the journal Nature Neuroscience has found some of the clearest evidence yet that animals really can judge time. Scientists set up an experiment known as the Virtual Doorstop Task, in which a mouse runs on a physical treadmill in a virtual reality environment. Over time, the mouse learns to run down a hallway to a door that is located about halfway down the track. After a wait of six seconds, the door opens, allowing the mouse to continue down the hallway and receive a reward. After running several training sessions, researchers made the door invisible in the virtual reality scene. Now, in this new scenario, the mouse still knew where the now invisible door was located based on the floor's changing textures. And it still waited for six seconds at the door before abruptly racing down the track to collect its reward. The important point is the mouse doesn't know when the door is open or closed because it's invisible. The only way it can solve the task efficiently is by using his brain's internal sense of time. So, now you know the real reason why Fluffy and Fido get upset when you don't feed them on time. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 